Good afternoon, dear guests, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Karsten Wilke, the director of the Center for Religious Studies uh, at uh, CEU. And uh, to open our uh, conference, Imperial Mysticisms, I want to invite the rector and president of Central European University, Michael Ignatiev, to uh, give a few uh, welcome remarks. Thank you, and if you're not a member of our community, welcome to see you. I welcome Alan Strathern for coming this way to talk to us. I'm looking forward to his lecture uh, greatly. Um, I thank Karsten and the whole team for organizing this. Um, about six weeks ago, I saw Karsten organizing another gathering in Vienna. So. If I had gold stars to hand out for virtue, I would hand them out to you. Organizing or being part of organizing a conference in two capital cities seems to me above and beyond the call. So thank you, Karsten, for, and thank you for the, uh, to the, uh, the Religious Studies Center for this kind of work. Um, I find the title extremely uh, fascinating and uh, it evokes very strong um, imaginative chords in me. As some of you know, I'm a Canadian, so I grew up in a, in a society that was absolutely chock-a-block full of imperial mysticism uh, because we were a British colony that had become a self-governing state. And the mysticism sometimes, when I was a child, took a very innocent form, which was a kind of unexplained interest in things British, like lion's corn syrup, innocent mysticism, a sense that certain products that were English were absolutely the best in the world, a, a kind of mysticism of an innocent kind that we share with India, with Pakistan, with, with uh, some African countries. And then some not so innocent examples of mysticism, which were the absolutely horrendous sacrifice that a young dominion, a self-governing dominion called Canada, paid during the First World War. That is, without very much effort or pushing or, or struggle, um, 100,000 Canadians went overseas, many of them to a, to a continent, Europe, that they'd never seen in their lives. And 60,000 of them didn't come home. 60,000 people died for king and empire. Uh, just my country. The same story could be told in India, it could be told in Pakistan, it could be told in, in, uh, in many of the African countries. Um, and it's an extra and rather somber um, 20th century example of a whole of a certain kind of mystical view of empire and its capacity to elicit blood sacrifice. And I think that's an important aspect of this story that I hope will get some discussion in your conference. I do think, I, I know you've come to hear Alan Strather, not to me, but just one additional thought. I was born after the Second World War, and I do think as a historian that the most important historical change in my lifetime has been the end of empire, the dismantling of the land empires of Britain, France, Portugal, the Netherlands, on and on and on. And finally, and most um, epical for this region, the collapse of the Soviet empire, there's a lot of loose talk about neo-imperialism and neo-colonialism continuing, and that's a real subject. But there's a very real difference between imperialism and neo-imperialism, between colonialism and neo-colonialism. And we need to study those differences and pay attention to them. But I can't help feeling that the end of empire was the great emotional, psychological, and cultural liberation of my lifetime. Although, because I'm a historian, the one thing a historian knows is that it's never over. And that's why the mysticism subject is so pertinent, because the physical empires may be over, but the mysticism that 
they used to create their hold over populations and the mysticism that still lingers uh, is an enormously important historical subject. Final remark, you can't understand Brexit unless you understand imperial mysticism. The deep ongoing hold of imperial ideologies, mysticism, nostalgia, folly de grandeur is an active driver of the politics of a country I love and respect to this day, to this minute. So we're on to a very interesting subject. I'm sorry, it's one of the privileges of being a rector. I get to expatiate on subjects where the invited guest knows much more than me. So I wish this conference the greatest success. Thank every, all the organizers and look forward to the lecture tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Michael Ignatiev, the rector and president, for the opening of this, uh, this conference. And it is an honor and pleasure for me as well to welcome the participant scholars and the audience uh, from the university community and beyond. The conference is organized uh, by the Center for Religious Studies of CEU. It is an intersection of many of our activities and interests in the study of cross-confessional phenomena and of uh, religious politics. The lion's share in the organization is with the present postdoctoral fellow of the center, Dr. Ute Falasch, who is, uh, who is here with us. Uh, moreover, this conference involves colleagues and uh, supporting units from across the university. Uh, such a large cooperation is appropriate for the choice of the topic of mysticism and early modern empire, that is a topic which is interdisciplinary, intercultural, and that is new. Both mystical spirituality and imperial politics are established object fields of historical research. However, they are rarely studied in their interconnectedness. The idea of this conference was born from the observation that in very different geographical and religious frameworks in a time period from the 16th to the 17th uh, century, an intimate alliance was concluded between the imperial dynasties and certain mystical movements and sects. King Philip II in El Escorial surrounded himself with advisors from contemplative religious orders, and so did his enemy, the Sultan Murad in Constantinople. Mystical orders uh, in the service of the empire taught spiritual exercises to the troops to prefer them, prepare them for, for battle and to newly converted populations in Bengal, in the Balkans, and in the Andean mountains. Mysticism was a factor largely overlooked in empire building, in political government, as well as in social organization, religious teaching, piety, and ritual. We have invited renowned scholars to study the structural parallels and differences between mystical movements of this imperial age in a global comparative approach, overlooking early modern empires from Ming China, the Mughals, Safavid, and Ottomans to the Catholic empires of Austria, Spain, and Portugal. Not to forget, mysticism flourished likewise among the minorities, Jews, Lutherans, Orthodox, and Eastern Christians. Research on mystics, mystical spirituality is divided between historicizing and universalistic trends. An important line of reflection on mysticism has insisted on its uh, historicity in an almost teleological fashion. Far from being a universal option of human religion, it, uh, mysticism occupies a stage in historical narrative. In an influential way that goes back to Hegel, mysticism appears as a synthesis between the immanence of mythic uh, uh, gods and its antithesis, the transcendence of the monotheistic god. Bypassing religious establishments built on the theistic dogma, the individual soul is discovered as a passageway to the hidden divine reality. 
other scholars of religion, especially Nocea Iliade, have defined mysticism uh, as an apolitical attitude, an inwardly organized orientation of religious psychology that appeals to uh, individual thinkers and believers from very different cultural and political frameworks and time periods. In Arthur Schopenhauer's definition, the mystic finds the eternal and unique truth in immediate, intimate, subjective perception, leaving to the philosopher the pursuit of objective knowledge that can be communicated to others. It is thus understandable that from a sociological perspective, and Strolch, for example, in his typology of church organizations, has identified mysticism with sectarianism and radical religious individual spirit. It is not surprising, thus, that uh, for a dominant historical school, the mystic is considered in his or her role as the other of the religious and political order, the individual, the dissident, the feminine, standing by definition in contrast to established power structures. Politics is absent also from the efforts that since Rudolf Otto have been devoted to the comparative study of Eastern and Western mysticisms. We want to look at mysticism and its connection with power structure. Opening the study of mystical politics, it might be time also to overcome the false opposition between a universalized and a historicized conception of mysticism. It may be possible to find transconfessional and even universal forces at work within history. Far from essentializing mysticism through its merely theological content, we follow recent trends in research that have studied both mysticism and empire from the perspective of their praxis, their practice in the social sense, in the sense of linguistic and symbolical communication, their practice in the sense of spiritual exercise, even in the physical and material sense. In Michel de Certeau's words, the two seemingly contradictory practices of rapture and rhetoric characterize mystical spirituality. I'm excited by the prospect that the conference may broker an encounter of workshops studying mystical and imperial practice res respectively, and that our focus on the, um, on the early modern world will allow us to shed light on such subjects as confessionalization, the individual liberty of conscience, and globalization. Uh, we, the organizers, hope that from a global perspective, it will be possible to understand better the appeal that mystical spirituality had to Muslims, Christians, and Jews of the period, and uh, to see a common picture emerge, perhaps even as a historical narrative, explaining the possible functions in the balance between rule and uh, diversity, and in the internalization of uh, political norms and uh, uh, claims of obedience. We also hope to question certain prejudiced East-West dichotomies with a memory of a time period in which there was a striking resemblance in the most controversial field in which cultural particularism expresses itself today, namely in the relations between the political and the religious, between the secularist power and the individual conscience. Finally, it is an open question how the partnership between contemplative movements and central powers fell apart and which currents of secular sovereignty or legalistic religion rose in its stead and which memory, which hidden afterlife was reserved to imperial mysticisms of the early modern period in the modern world until today. My colleague and co-organizer of the conference, Dr. Ute Fallasch, will now present the course of the eventful three days that are ahead and to which I'm looking forward. Thank you, Karsten. Um, yeah, ladies and gentlemen, it gives me a great pleasure uh, to welcome you all at this afternoon to our conference, Imperial uh, mysticisms, piety and power in early modern empires from a global perspective. 
um, the idea for this conference uh, was born over a year ago. And over this period, the Center for Religious Studies deliberated, collaborated, and planned what has taken concrete shape today. We were encouraged all along by the assistance and suggestions we received from various colleagues across departments, research uh, scholars, and students, and we thank all of them for their support. I especially would like to thank Tiana Kristic for being an amazing source of inspiration at all stages of um, the organization, as well as Esther Holbrook, um, who <laughs> just <laughs> moves up there. Uh, as, um, she is the coordinator at the Center for Religious Studies, and uh, she has wonderfully worked and uh, gave a tireless effort to make um, this all happening today. Furthermore, we express our gratitude uh, for the financial support uh, received from the Auto Confession Project, the CEU fu uh, event funding, the CEU's Early Modern Studies Platform, as well as the Sudava Memorial Foundation, without which of, um, uh, none of this would have been possible. Especially, we would like to thank the participant scholars, of course, for accepting our invitation and for finding their way to Budapest. Our endeavor in the process of um, outlining the conference and to address the question of what role mystics and mystical brother, um, brotherhoods played in the process of empire formation was to facilitate an approach that can be justified as global. Therefore, we are very glad to have contributors that will span an area uh, that reaches from the Americas up to China. In order to give the deliberations a coherence and concrete direction, we organize the presentations into panels that focus on different aspects of the convergence of mysticism and political power. And thus shall facilitate comparisons between the selected papers. In this way, we hope we will be able to explore underlying patterns with regard to the alliance of the state and mystical movements and to de detect similarities and differences in the dynamics of their interaction. We start the discussion with the focal point of the conference and the question of how mystic worldviews engaged with experiences of sovereignty. Religious imagination has often drawn on the language of political sovereignty in order to represent divine creation, providence, and rulership. Mystic cosmo cosmologies, however, complicate these metaphors. God is at the same time transcendent and immanent. The religious subject is sim simultaneously depreciated as a void vessel and sanctified as a co-ruler of the universe. Thus, the link between spirituality and politics will be explored by focusing on the metaphorical constructions of the world order in early modern mystic imaginations. We do find in all of the early modern empires the interaction between mystical traditions and political sovereignty acquired a new dynamic. However, it is important to ask what exactly was new in those dynamics and in which ways they drew upon earlier developments. In order to reflect on the ancient and medieval precedents for the incorporation of mystical traditions into the political realm, we will look back to an important foundational moment, namely the political reception of Neoplatonism in the ancient Roman Empire, as well as the emergence of an influential pattern of alliance between dynasties and mystical brotherhood in 15th century Syria and political activities of mystics in late medieval Europe. Asking how mysticism facilitated the formation of early modern empires points, of course, into two directions, into the one of the mystical brotherhoods and movements and into the direction of the court and the person of the king. The fascinating panel on mystic rulers and esoteric courts will explore in which ways mystical concepts of sacred kingship were used for legitimizing purposes, attributing supreme spiritual virtues to the king's mind and body. Another important aspect of the conference is to explore in which ways mystical movements presented potential services to the state. Emphasis here will be laid on the social organization of brotherhoods, and orders within the early modern empires through new institutional patterns that created far-flung uh, flung networks. We will be exploring the strategies applied to incorporate the infrastructure of mystics into state clergy, bureaucracy, and educational enterprises, 
and other spheres of society. We will posit the question, what were the mutual benefits that derived from an imperial patronage in terms of governance and propaganda? Mystical spirit spirituality often follows a strategy of confessional ambivalence and was therefore particularly adept uh, at copying, uh, coping with situations of cross-cultural uh, religious encounter. Sorry. Due to the wide range of access to piety that mystics offered, they were able to reach out to populations that stood socially, geographically, and culturally far from the centers of power. In this sense, mystics were able to function as mediators between the political realm and the subjects of empire right to the grassroots level, and thus functioned as a vehicle of cross-cultural cohesion. An aspect that highlights the fact that early modern empires spent societies of immense plurality is the fact that mystics were active in all religious minorities. From the minority position, mystics had to negotiate their relation with the state in order to obtain protection against persecution. We will consider the, their public image and the political strategies that they and their followers employed in order to negotiate their position within the imperial frameworks or towards other religious groups. Many early modern, um, early modern mystics were influential charismatic personalities who developed their own claims to leadership and power in conjunction with the ruler. Therefore, it would be negligent to not explore the question in which ways the mystics claim to a superior knowledge by illumination could also become a threat to other political and religious authorities. On what basis did the state and the religious authorities distinguish between saintly and deviant mystical movements? The alliance between mystical movements and the state seems to be strongest between the 16th and the 17th century, and I think this is a question we will have to discuss further. However, starting from the 17th century, we find in the Christian world, rule and piety seem to have parted ways. While Sufi brotherhoods continued to be deeply embedded in Muslim societies, however, their practices and doctri doctrines attracted criticism from more legalistical-minded religious scholars and even from within the Sufi brotherhood themselves. Therefore, in our final discussion, we aim at exploring the question if it is possible to conceptualize and narrate the cooperation between empire and mysticism as a global phenomenon. Can we detect underlying patterns that are similar in the different early modern empires on a global scale? What kind of differences do we encounter in the dynamics and which consequences in the alliance between power and mystical movements do, do, this, uh, do they entail? And finally, is it possible to propose a common periodization fitting the religious environments of various um, continents? We do not conceptualize this conference merely as a four-day event. Instead, we want this to uh, be the beginning of something concrete and ongoing. And at the end, we hope to synthesize the ideas and insights uh, expounded in the sessions and at the concluding deliberations on day four in order to come up um, with a plan that to publish a conference volume. We hope that these four days will be an enriching and fulfilling experience for all of us individually and that the intellectually stimulating exchange of ideas will suggest new avenues for the study of mysticism as a particular aspect during the formation of empire in early modernity. And now it is my privilege uh, to introduce to you our keynote speaker, Alan Strathern. Alan studied history and anthropology at the University College London, where he graduated in 1997 um, with distinction. His degree as Doctor of Philosophy in History he received from the Trinity College, University of Oxford in 2002. From Oxford, Alan moved to Cambridge, where he was Old Dominion Research Fellow at Clare Hall until 2008, and afterwards College Lecturer, Fellow, and Director of Studies in History at Churchill College. College. In 2011, he returned to the University of Oxford, where he is Associate Professor at the Faculty of History and a Fellow of Brazenose College. In 2016, 
Alan was awarded the British Academy Mid-Career Fellowship and was visiting with senior research fellow at the Asia Research Institute in Singapore. Alan received a number of further awards and fundings of which I would like to mention only the Philip Leverhulme Prize in History in 2010 and the OUP's John Fell Research Fund in 2019. Alan has worked ex extensively on the history of Sri Lanka, foremost on kingship in early modernity. In 2007, his monograph, Kingship and Conversion in 16th Century Sri Lanka, Portuguese Imperialism in a Buddhist Land, was published with Cambridge University Press. And together with Zoltan Wiedermann, he edited the volume Sri Lanka at the Crossroads of History, which was published in 2017 with UCL Press. Since some years, however, Alan is working on the global uh, history of religious encounter and change. His most recent work is Unearthly Powers, Religious and Political Change in World History, which was published at Cambridge in 2019. In this fascinating work of comparative history, Alan is using an impressive range of examples from ancient Rome to the Incas or 19th century Tahiti to explore phenomena such as sacred kingship, millennialism, state church uh, struggles, reformations, iconoclasm, and above all, conversion. He sets out a new way of thinking about transformations in the fundamental nature of religion and its interaction with, a, with political authority. We also can look forward to a forthcoming companion volume, Converting Kings, Congo, Japan, Thailand, and Hawaii compared 1450 to 1850, in which he will use focused case studies to explain why ruling elites turned to monotheism in some parts of the world and rejected it in others, as well as to the volume uh, Sacred Kingship in World History between Immanence and Transcendence, which he is co-editing together with Asfar Moin. We are pri privileged to have Alan Stratham with us today, and now with further ado, please, Alan. Thank you very much. Um, just to make sure you, there, there's a handout. Have you, you all received the handout? It's a bit confusing. Don't worry about it too much. Um, a lot of what's on the handout is actually going to be uh, on the PowerPoint. So I'm very... I'm honored by this invitation to speak by, by, from Uta Falash, Karsten Wilker, and the Center for Religious Studies, uh, particularly because I'm, I'm not really an expert in mysticism. And so it was only the invitation to speak here today that, 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 um, that, that in induced this talk. Well, Pedro de Bastu, a humble Jesuit lay brother who lived in 17th century Portuguese India, was blessed or cursed by, by a torrent of visions and voices, devilish and angelic which gave him the powers of clairvoyance and prophecy. People such as these, and we'll talk about many of them today, have existed in all times and places. Where are they now? Have you ever wondered that? The likelihood is that uh, many of, some of them are medicated. I was recently at a fascinating uh, workshop um, being given by Tanya Lerman, an anthropologist who has a comparative study of shamanic types from China to Vanuatu. And she finds that a, a portion of these people would, if they were being placed in the setting of Western psychiatry, be uh, diagnosed as suffering from psychosis, a major, definition, major uh, feature of, psychosis, of, of psychosis is, of course, auditory and visual hallucinations. But only a portion. Others, it seemed, are able to discern, discern external voices by achieving an altered state of consciousness or a trance state, uh, through many different means, many different kinds of mental exercises, physical exercises. All these, perhaps, are ways of breaking down the experience of selfhood so that the barrier between self and the world dissolves or becomes porous. The Ignatian exercises with which Bashta would have been familiar may be seen as a means of doing this, of turning in, inner cognition into the experience of God as an external reality. I think Bashta was also probably suffering from a psychosis, because his hallucinations were particularly real, vivid, externalized, potentially negative, and overwhelming. But for these people, Lerman has found, when you place them in a cultural setting in which religion allows them to imbue their experiences with uh, meaning, actually the diagnosis is better than if you treat them with Western um, psychiatric methods. It seems to make the voices negotiable, it lends the sufferer status. 
However they're generated, though, these visions, some of us have them. And then what's fascinating is the rest of, the, rest of us crowd round and use their visions to saturate our own existence with some meaning. Something in which every Portuguese in Asia felt invested was the precarious fate of their improbable empire. And many of the, his visions, Bashtos, were on just this subject. And now we arrive at the real point of this conference, where I'm going to turn swiftly from psychology to something more like sociology. And I'd like us to begin by noticing the limits to Bashtu's claims. While he was, making, he was making a claim about the sacred destiny of the Portuguese monarchy, he was not claiming that the Portuguese kings were themselves divine, nor that he, he was a messianic figure, Bashtu himself. Contrast this with a figure such as Sheikh Arifi Husseini at the court of the Mughal em Emperor Akbar, whom we learn about in Asfar Moin's work. Sheikh Arif was descended from the Safavid Emperor Shah Ismail, renowned for miracles such as walking out of locked rooms, and claimed indeed to be the Messiah. Akbar is reported to have exclaimed, Shah, either become like me or make me like yourself. For Akbar, and Akbar himself, was of course, was famous for his miraculous and messianic claims. Akbar here was returning the image of sacred rule to an ancient and widespread form. The rulers of other great empires in ancient Egypt, or the Mongols or the Incas, claimed in an important sense to embody the divine. And yet here again there's a difference. Muslim rulers such as Akbar or Shah Ismail, who made such claims, also became vulnerable to criticisms, to accusations of heresy of the kind that might arise in exactly the Christian world. This would simply make no sense in the imperial realms of ancient Egypt, the Incas, or the Mongols. What structures are at work here, constraining and shaping the kinds of claims that mystics and kings could make? I'm going to try to answer this by adopting a very broad, global, and long-term perspective. So my task is to try and provide some organizing concepts that will give some kind of comparative grip on the rich diversity of cases at this conference. And I have to say from the outset, it, it involves a far higher degree of abstraction or generalization than historians are normally comfortable with. The basic concepts are taken from uh, my recent book, Unearthly Powers, which sets out a way of thinking about religion and its relationship with politics throughout world history. I can only give a really brutal condensation of the core concepts here, um, some of it's summarized a bit more in the PowerPoint, but really, if it's confusing, um, I apologize, and I will urge you to try and look at the book. Yeah, well, I would say that, wouldn't I? Um, I suggest that there is a default form of human religious activity, which can be found in every society under the sun. It's called immanentism. And uh, here is a very short definition, but it's in fact defined by 10 different characteristics which are listed on the handout if, if you want to refer to that later. This is really the tendency to imagine that, the su that supernatural forces and beings are present or imminent in the world and that we must interact with them in spirits, demons, ancestors, ancestors, gods. Uh, Marshall Salins uses the term metapersons to describe them. We must interact with these beings in order to flourish. That every recorded society has done this suggests that evolved features of human cognition are at work. So the underlying cognitive structure here is the rampant attribution of, mean, of motivated agency to meaningful chains of cause and effect. Now anything that human beings may want to achieve is dependent on the agency of these beings, but they are profoundly in and of the world and that's something that's important to understand. So if, even if, they, if they're not ancestors, let's say they're more godlike. Let's say they're the gods of the Olympian gods. Well, they actually live literally on a mountain, and they are human-like in their, in their um, attitudes. They may be selfish, petty, angry, peevish, and so on. These, these ritual and mythical systems did not conceive of a realm of religion. There is no emic concept of religion as distinct from other spheres. They don't have a notion of belonging to a religion as if it was one choice amongst others. They do not try and force a breach between the natural and the supernatural spheres. And they do not curtail revelation and fix it into texts. All of this then entails an ontology that is fundamentally monistic. And this is the way of religion for most of human history. That is, 
until the axial age of the middle centuries of the first millennium BC, where we see a, an out, a series of philosophical revolutions in West Asia, Greece, India, and China. In the Abrahamic and Indic cases, the chief result of this is a new religious form, which I describe as transcendentalism. So the, ultimately the Jewish, Christian, and Muslim traditions, and of course the um, Hinduism to some extent, and Buddhism. Transcendentalism cuts the monistic vision in two. It divides religion into a mundane sphere that's inherently corrupt and unsatisfactory, and a vision of a sacred dimension of existence that in one sense at least is literally ineffable, transcending any capacity of the human mind to represent it. Their followers yearn to attain that state nonetheless. This is salvation. It is heaven. It's nirvana. It's now the primary focus of religious activity. In this vision, suffering in this life may even be a marker of spiritual attainment. And this is asserted in a highly self-conscious way. I borrow Ernest Gellner's term offensiveness to describe this. These are ideologies that are predicated on the existence of and inferiority of other systems. Therein, of course, lies the capacity for religious identities. You can now be Christian or be Buddhist. The sphere of the sacred, the truly sacred, is characterized by absolute good. Religion becomes the search for the good, as something distinct from human flourishing note. And this, in, that, this involves the development of a universal ethics of an explicit codified morality. This also involves an entirely new valuation of interiority, of the self, as something that's explored in prayer or meditation, for example. So there is, in other words, a transformative shifting of religious life from the communal to the individual come universal. For the transcendentalist traditions are often portable. They're infinite in potential extension. And what's really important for us at this conference to note is this is based on a determined effect to close down revelation, to fix it in canonical texts. Those texts or scripture are the foundation for the authority of a class of, of priesthood or a clerisy which acquires a new and far stronger quality of autonomy from the political sphere. And that autonomy is reflected in their vast moral authority, their relationship to the ultimate ends of life set against which the concerns of mundane politics may be deemed entirely trivial. So these are just some of the 15 characteristics by which I define transcendentalism. If that's really tough, think of a trinity of uh, truth, ethics, and salvation. In the book, I use, mostly use Buddhism and Christianity to, to um, flesh out what I mean by transcendentalism, although it can take uh, other forms. You might find it in forms of Hinduism, Jainism, Sikhism, Taoism. And then you might ask, what are the names of the immanentist religious systems of course, they have no name. These are the religions that do not conceive of themselves as religions in that sense. However, the vision of transcendentalism that I've just outlined looks like no religious tradition that has ever existed. And that's because it always forms an amalgamation with immanentism. Transcendentalisms are bound up with immanentism at their inception. Consider, consider Jesus as a great flash of the imminent, the unspeakable divine made flesh and blood and dispensing miracles to the needy. But notice they're also subsequently subject to processes of immanentization for a whole variety of reasons that I discuss in the chapter. Above all, the basic structures of human cognition and emotion that created immanentism remain in place. The constant search to access supernatural power to help the crops grow or heal the sick or win the next battle remain and ensure that new ritual forms are constantly generated. Saints emerge in both Islam and Christianity to bridge the great divide. Bibles and Qurans could become magical objects, condensations of baraka or grace. My central argument, in fact, will be to suggest that mysticism is one of the most important vehicles of precisely this process. All kinds of ironies and paradoxes are set off once these transcendentalist traditions make their journey from the margins to the center ground of any society. Think of monasteries that start out gaining power from their isolation from society, their rejection of worldly luxury, and end up at the center of a community's life and fabulously wealthy as a result. 
And yet, these processes may in turn stimulate countervailing forms of retranscendentalization. Re or why don't we just say, much more simply, reform? In Christianity, only the most obvious of these was the Reformation. Whatever else the Reformation was, and it was much else, it was surely at bottom an attempt to reassert the defining features of transcendentalism, to push apart the spheres of the mundane and the transmundane, to question and limit the multiplying vehicles of imminent power. Now, if I suggest that in any given world religion, transcendentalism and imminentism are always combined, you might say, well, why do you bother separating them? And the first reason is that the reverse is not true. As you can see from this diagram, imminentism has existed untroubled by transcendentalism for most of human history. From a global and long durée perspective, that's a fact of great importance. It's only been quite recently in human history that we've been dominated by the, syn the synthesis types. The second is that within religions like is Islam or Buddhism, these two forces exist not in a state of happy symbiosis, but one of tension, and one can trace their flux and recoil as they both react to and drive the force of events. One thing this model does is help us in turn to distinguish between two types of sacred kingship, which is in some ways quite a vague term for comparative uh, purposes. So imminentism promotes what I refer to as divinized kingship, which is the urge to treat the monarch as if he or she were a god and imagine them as having something divine or close to divine in their being. That's a deeply ambiguous process, but it allows the monarch to become, become a kind of ritual device for interceding with the supernatural forces determining human affairs. It helps explain a whole host of commonalities in the way that disconnected human societies have conceived of what it is to create a king. So the, the impulse to dehumanize the king by making him close to the gods means that in societies from the Incas to Benin to Ayutthaya, we find a prohibition on anybody watching the king eat. In these systems, monarchs may be seen as the children of gods, their brothers, their lovers. They instantiate deities. They're possessed by them. They're granted their powers, classically the powers of rainmaker kings in sub-Saharan Africa. However, transcendentalism drives a rather different vision, that of righteous kingship. For more emphasis is placed on the moral status of rulers and their place in a grand soteriological drama. It's not their ritual intercession which matters now, but their role in establishing the conditions within which their subjects may obtain salvation. Therefore, when Khan Boris of the Bulgars was converted in the mid-860s, the Patriarch of Constantinople finished a long letter to him by exclaiming, May you be for me a model and an example of every virtue and piety, not only to those under you, but also a beautiful and great encouragement to the entire race of mankind to achieve noble ends. Is this not a severe expectation? When kings are divinized, it is their human mortality and weakness that must somehow be obscured. When kings are made righteous, it is their human immorality and their violence that must be effaced by any sacred system. Note that kings can be righteous entities. They may be appointed by God, for example, but be emphatically human and treated fundamentally as if they're human. This tallies with an important theme in some of the more philosophical literature of the Axial Age, for example, Charles Taylor, in which the arrival of transcendentalism carries within it the seeds of the disenchantment of the world. However, I would say that in practice, again, we find a synthesis in which righteous traditions of kings may combine with tendencies to divinization. I shall return to this point, but for the moment, we'll just note one way in which this happens is when rulers wish to assert their superiority over the religious sphere, over the church, the sangha, and the ulema. <clears throat> well, you've had to take a great chunk of the book um, there in what I, I rushed through it, I don't know, 10, 15 minutes. And there's a, there's a great risk that I've come across as being overly mystical or, or mantic uh, myself. Um, but now I finally arrive uh, at mysticism itself. And just to reiterate, 
Um, it was only this invitation that made me really try to think how mysticism could possibly fit inside this uh, model, which makes what I'm going to say here uh, deeply experimental. It's not been tested in print or, or uh, uh, you know, presentation before. So it follows from the way that I've presented mystics that in one sense we're going to find people like them in all religious categories. So it doesn't matter whether we're talking about immanentist or transcendentalist. You know, you'll find shamans, oracles, prophets, and they all do a similar job. And, and that's the definition there. It's a really simple one. People credited with the capacity to experience supernatural beings and dimensions of existence not ordinarily available to the senses. Um, that's up for debate, and it's a simple one. But I think nearly everybody at this conference is are talking about Muslim and Christian uh, mystics, and they, for me, I'd like to suggest, form a distinct subtype. So, so they form really a subtype of this very broad category. <clears throat> now, clearly, mysticism has long been understood as a mediator between the transcendent and the mundane, as these words have often been understood, and I got a bit worried when Carsten Wilke was speaking because I thought, have I just reinvented Hegel completely unwittingly? I've never read um, Hegel, um, so um, <clears throat> I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. But it's long been understood that, God, that mystics are a, a, um, a mediator between heaven and earth, between God and man. But I want to suggest something slightly uh, different, subtly different, which is that they are a, a mediator between transcendentalism and immanentism. That is, they create a, a bridge between these two, two modes of religious activity. And a lot of the power of mystics that we'll be discussing comes from the way that they combine this. So I've had to strip a lot of the examples that I was going to use to illustrate my talk in order to keep it within a reasonable time. Um, so I'm just, so this is going to be uh, quite abstract. Uh, but first of all, Mystics, the mystics we're dealing with, are all rooted in transcendentalism in some very profound ways. And that's what gives them the legitimacy they need in order to operate in Muslim and Christian settings. So first of all, they're soteriological virtuosi. The effect of their visions is to place themselves as unusually secure in their salvation and potentially able to secure the salvation of others. And that's, of course, how they so frequently become saints or friends of God. Second, the nature of the mystical experience is profoundly transcendentalist insofar as it is a personal and interior phenomenon. So this is an individualized spirituality. Thirdly, mystics in the world religions are ethically positive. Now this may seem obvious, but in fact my broad definition of the mystic that I started with could actually apply to sorcerers and witches and so on, whereas our subset is distinctive by association with the highest good. However, now we come to the ways in which mysticism acts to unleash immanentism, and it's these which deserve our special attention, for their importance in the dynamics of conversion and for the way in which, over the long run, they make mysticism vulnerable to criticism. <clears throat> so firstly, by providing a new form of access to revelation, mystics undermine a great defining feature of the transcendentalist traditions, as I outlined, uh, outlined them, that they're based on a fundamental single point of historical revelation, normally associated with historical figures such as Jesus or Buddha. Indeed, that means a further defining feature of transcendentalism is overthrown, which is their foundation in canonized text. And that's simply because the quirks of human, con human cognition that, we, that are construed as revelation continue. Human beings continue to dream. They continue to have ecstatic experiences. Mysticism is the name that we give to these experiences when they happen within the setting of a world religion. The potential result, of course, is that not only scripture, but the authority of the priests and scholars who interpret it is evaded. And that's what unleashes the sheer creativity of post-Mongol Islamic political theology, for example, which is only now being truly unveiled by recent historiography. Second, Mystical experiences make nonsense of the ontological rupture of transcendentalism and therefore may stimulate new philosophical or theological understandings. Now, I'm going to leave how this works to the experts, who are you, but in the, in the case of Islam, 
Surely there's a connection between the self-world dissolution characterising the mystical experience and the development of more monist philosophies which flourished within and facilitated certain traditions of Sufism. I'm thinking above all, of course, of Ibn Arabi and the principle of the unity of being. His teachings have been described as pantheistic or by Asfar Moin, uh, drawing on the work of uh, Jan Asman, as cosmotheistic. All of these terms are trying to get at a central feature of what I refer to as immanentism, the sacralization of the world around us. Mystics don't just unblock knowledge of the supernatural, this is my point three, but also its inherent power, which frequently manifests as miracles. Where mystics become saints, they're nearly always endowed with the capacity to heal or control the weather, if not in life, then in death, through their shrines and relics. And in that specific sense, they are entirely akin to the witches and sorcerers and others that I just mentioned. This is absolutely vital to understanding their socio-political significance. It might be the most important thing. I'm not really going to talk much about the last two. We can discuss it in questions if, if you like. Um, uh, the fourth one is really related to some work in the cognitive science of religion. Um, and the, the, fourth one, uh, the fifth one we can, we can discuss, as I say. Um, I'm now going to talk a bit uh, about the political implications of mysticism. Um, and I suppose I should say that it's the way that mysticism combines these two modes of, of uh, religiosity that gives it a huge amount of social power, the power to, to create groups, to drive them, uh, to motivate them. And of course, as you'd expect, that makes, in political terms, mysticism both threat and opportunity. So mysticism as threat. Now, one of the possible advantages of rulers for world religions, just one of the reasons why they did sweep across the world, perhaps, is, so I'm talking about Christianity, Islam, Buddhism, and so on, is their capacity to contain and centralize the religious sphere, which is placed in the hands of an institutional network or a body of scholars, a church, an ulema, a sangha, that's then placed in a, relation, a tight dialogue with the ruler. Mystics, however, of course, threaten to blow this apart. They may arise from anywhere. They may disregard those institutions entirely. They may create their own followers. They may elevate rebels into the status of divine emissaries. They, they may cast reigning kings as servants of the evil. And when mystics as saints die, they sink their authority and supernatural power into the soil in the form of shrines and thereby create a new sacred geography that the court may not have anything to deal with, to do with. So mysticism as opportunity. Of course, it also goes, this presents a great opportunity for rulers. They too can now leech authority from the priestly scholarly class by sacralizing their being. That is, if you recall the typology of sacred kingship I used earlier, mystical authority allows rulers to inflate both the righteous and the divinized quality of sacred kingship. The ruler is made righteous by placing them in the center stage of a drama of salvation and eschatology. They can be made the figures of millenarian hope. They can become prophets or mystics or saints in themselves. But more importantly, mysticism affords a means by which the deep mistrust of divinized kingship within monotheism may be overcome. Monism established a basic philosophical basis by which visible humans could again become equated with the divine. A most uh, concrete example would be Ibn Arabi's theory of the perfect man, who acts as a mirror of the divine. If mystics are defined by their mediatory function, so too, of course, are divinized kings. They are also pitched between heaven and earth. They're all also both human and yet more than human. This is what makes the divinized king different to the righteous one. He's not just a symbol of the divine or chosen by it. The divine is in some sense truly imminent bodily within him or occasionally her. <clears throat> it may even leak out of him as the case of Akbar and his miracles show. The paradigmatic example, of course, of how close the mystic is, can be come to the king is the case of the Safavids. I want to emphasize, though, that this represents a return to, the, to an ancient and widespread mode of sacralizing royal authority. And we see generated in entirely disconnected parts of the world. So it's not as if this has to be the product of, of circulation. 
in which rulers are equated with the cosmos were seen as the means by which its life-giving forces could be channeled for human benefit so that the ruler is a kind of conduit for life itself and therefore repeatedly associated with the sun. Two weeks ago, by the way, the new Japanese emperor Naruhito underwent the private climax to his accession rituals, the symbolism of which uh, clearly references these themes. The Daijo Sai is an act of uh, extremely private intercession with the rice uh, fertility goddess. But this has mostly died out across the world. This is just a, a very late um, and, and small echo of a much more long-standing and fundamental uh, idea in human society. Lastly, and very briefly, mysticism is able to create unity and diversity, as the title of a recent volume put it. And that's precisely because it dissolves certain features of transcendentalism, which in turn softens the rigidity of its identity barriers. In that way, mysticism actually makes uh, religions like Christianity and Islam much closer to the Indic versions of transcendentalism, closer to Buddhism or Hinduism, in, in their capacity to interact with other traditions in a non-hostile way. For example, by allowing a notion of multiple levels of truth to be entertained, which is something that we find in the Indic and the East Asian worlds, but um, mysticism is its driver in monotheism. And most importantly, the delivery of imminent power, of magic and miracles, has an innate capacity to reach across all boundaries, drawing veneration from people of any cultic affiliation, as a great deal of South Asian work has shown, and as I think we will hear from Uta Falash on Friday. Now, it will not have escaped your notice that most, most of what I've been saying really pertains to Islam. And that's because it seems to me that the political consequences of mysticism were so much more profound in the Islamic world than in the Christian. Looking forward to the talk by Gabor uh, Klanitsai tomorrow, I may have cause to qualify this point um, or back away from it. But for the moment, let's take it as a starting proposition. If it is the case, why should it be so? From a world historical perspective, the two monotheisms are in many ways profoundly similar. And they both develop a cult of saints a few centuries after their founding revelations. One could even draw a parallel between the way the papal revolution solidified the church-state divide in Christendom and the way the Sunni jurisprudential model took hold in Islam from the 10th century. Both served to push apart the spiritual and temporal poles of authority and both inhibited the divinization of kings and sultans. And this was, thus was transcendentalism strengthened. And then in the Muslim world, all that changed. It didn't in Christendom. In Christendom, there would be no equivalent to Akbar, no king who made himself the center of po some post-Christian ruler cult. There was nothing like the, the, the case of the Safavids, in which a mystical religious order becomes a ruling dynasty. Christian mystics did not become state makers in the way that Sufis did in Central, Central Asia, Africa, and Southeast Asia. We will hear on Saturday about Thomas Munzer. Imagine if he had created a central European empire based at Mulhausen. Then we might have some comparability with the Islamic world. In terms of the much discussed issue of millenarianism, there are interesting parallels with the reign of Charles V, which are illuminating on one level, but we don't have any real Christian equivalents to the direct assertions of messianic kingship by Muslim rulers. Perhaps the closest would be the hope surrounding the return of the King Dom Sebastião, killed in 1578. We do not have kings making cosmological claims based on their direct descendants from Jesus. So one question for us to ask, if we're serious about doing comparison and therefore can stomach this kind of generalizing excise, is why should that be so? Most important is, an obvious one, but a really important one, in that there's no equivalent to the Catholic Church in, Isla in Islam, and, there, and the Church surely exercises a very strong control over the meaning of sainthood, lim limiting it, for example, to dead people, which is a really uh, good move. It's of immense importance that Muslim saints can procreate and pass their sanctity on to their descendants. Imminent power becomes an almost 
biological substance here. But I just want to explore a bit whether there is a geopolitical or geo-religious logic here. Christendom, once it's converted the kings of Europe, then becomes encircled by the oceans on one side and the belt of Islamdom and the steppes on the other. It has, to be sure, an internal and never quite suppressed voice of paganism in the form of Greco-Roman intellectual heritage, but it never really has to deal with a complex array of religious others. There's a tiny minority of Jews who are easily demonized. Real living barbarian pagan military power is no more. The church is able to sanction a huge array of imminentist practice, but also take a very firm uh, control over its expression and its limits. But Islam is in a different predicament from early on. First, Muslim empires expand rapidly over regions already containing peoples of the book who are red relatively hard to convert. So from the start, empire becomes predicated on religious pluralism. Secondly, they also open up long frontiers with religious traditions quite alien to the Abrahamic tradition. This includes swathes of imminentist societies in Central Asia, uh, uh, above all, Africa and maritime Southeast Asia. Now, if imminent societies are normally easier to convert over time, the South Asian frontier brings Islam into contact with the world of, Isla of Hinduism, and this provides a whole other set of challenges, which uh, Moyn will uh, discuss in due course. Thirdly, the Islamic world resides in what Vic Lieberman calls the exposed zone, a vast expanse of Eurasia from the plains of Hungary to the Sea of Japan extending into South Asia. This is not a map of uh, the exposed zone. This is a map of uh, arid or semi-arid regions which uh, do a lot to help determine what the exposed zone is. What Lieberman means is that this whole realm is subject to the uh, empire-building feats of inner Asian horse-born uh, warrior elites. And they can create much larger empires in this zone than we see, for example, in Western Europe or mainland Southeast Asia, what Lehman calls the protected zone. And it also means that uh, empire building is subject to incursion by inner Asian warrior elites successively. The most important one for us, of course, is the Mongol eruption in taking Baghdad and smashing apart the caliphate, which amounts to a form of creative destruction that there is no parallel for in the Christian world. Now, on the one hand, it's precisely because the ancestral religion of the Mongols is imminentist that they were liable to convert to the religions of the people that they conquered. But at the same time, this process of converting powerful pagan rulers tends to involve deep a deep process of imminentization on the part of Islam, which is, in a sense, not quite converted to, but at least deeply influenced by, um, for example, Mongol political theology. Um, I'm thinking here of Jonathan Brack's work on the Ilkhanid vizier Rashid al-Din, who developed particularly strong claims about the closeness of the Chinggisid rulers to God. Uh, so he's much assisted by Ibn Arabi's uh, thought, but also by the need to find equivalent forms for the Chinggisid concept of su or charisma, which expresses a form of divinization very, very directly. By these means, the 14th century ruler al Jaitu could be credited with extraordinary feats such as protecting the realm from drought or reading people's minds. So in summary, if you buy the geopolitical argument, the Islamic world faces A, much larger territorial imper uh, imperial formations, the land, land empires, B, much greater religious pluralism within those empires, is before the, I'm talking about before the uh, Iberian voyages, and C, much more profound interaction with powerful and independent pagan peoples whom it has to absorb as conquerors and not just as subjects. All of these conditions demanded that imminentist impulses be accommodated. And the point is, this in turn calls upon mysticism to act as the mediating vehicle. So I just have one uh, last section which is to try to take up Uta's uh, challenge and think about chronology um, to see if we can make any general comments of, about the chronology of mysticism 
and its political influence in the Islamic world. And this is a, uh, a foolhardy task, even more foolhardy than everything else I've just been talking about. Um, but somebody has to kick off an attempt at a comparative discussion. So from the late 16th century, some scholars have seen signs of a gathering pushback in which the claims of imminent power or millennial being become problematized. So Niall Green, in his overview of Sufism, refers to a crisis of conscience following the turn of the Islamic millennium in 1591. What he's describing really is what I would see as a reassertion of transcendentalism against the mystic monistic millennial pattern. Remember that I said the two modes of religiosity may be thought of as existing in a state of tension. So just to take that metaphor further, and it's no more than a metaphor, we can say that transcendentalism is like a rubber band. It can only be pushed so far, stretched so far in incorporating immanentism before at some point it triggers a pullback. At least that's what we see in history, a pullback which we can describe as reform. That's because the authority that still inheres in scripture and the institutional power of the clerisy demands it. At some point, claims of heresy, of innovation, of exaggeration are going to find their voice. Of course, why that happens is dependent upon contingent historical and political uh, developments. What allows that voice to gain strength or to be diminished has to be related in some form to the dynamics of state formation. Um, and um, I'm just going to suggest that there may be different ideological needs for creating and expanding a state than there may be for consolidating a state. And that's just a suggestion. And I had some East Asian examples to give you uh, about the, the foundation of the Ming and the transition from the Sengoku period to civil war, from, of civil war in Japan to the Tokugawa shogunate, but we'll have to leave those for discussion. In the Islamic world, one of the most important consequences of the Mo Mongol eruption is simply that it, it creates an immensely fluid uh, zone of state formation in which warrior elites are thrust into competition for claims of sacred legitimacy and supernatural power. But by the 16th century, we have a shift from periods of frenetic state expansion to uh, a, a period of consolidation. Um, and is there not some connection here I don't know what it is, really. I'm just, you know, throwing this out there. But is there not some connection between this and the growing predominance of ulema Islam, of legalism, doctrinalism, orthodoxy, creation, classic features of transcendentalism? Green, at least, explicitly notes the shift to the legal bureaucratic rationality developed by growing imperial states. Perhaps the need to accommodate diverse others and uh, to accommodate relig imminentist religiosity per se has diminished, perhaps pacification and discipline becomes a major aim. Perhaps the settings are created somehow for bottom-up reformist movements. Once again, the very well-known case of the Safavids and 12 Shiism uh, springs to mind. What is blindingly obvious is that however much the dynasties of the Muslim gunpowder empires had risen by ascending the ladder of millenia millennial mysticism, they all came to appreciate now is the time for the ladder to be taken away. Because by doing away with the containment of revelation, Sufi millenarianism all too readily disperses authority outside the control of the ruler, the dynasty. Now you can try frantically to monopolize those sources of social power yourself. I'd suggest these claims are easier to make when the ruler can also generate charisma in the Weberian sense through striking success in battle. It's harder to do it when the phase of great expansion has ceased, and especially where rulers become creatures of the palace. Indeed, all three Islamic dynasties are rocked by troublesome millennial groups that they have to find some answer to. In which case, there is only one solution, and that's to put the genie back into the bottle by reanimating a transcendentalist discourse reprehending imminentism and its scripture rubbishing revelation. In short, what you may need to stabilize a state is not what you need to uh, create it. So my last comment, um, how might all this relate to the now widely used language of early modernity to discuss Asian and global developments, which any of you in this field will know is a very, very dominant uh, discourse? 
There's no, but very rarely applied to religion, by the way, um, unless you're looking at connected history, uh, um, where it can be done. There's no doubt that the riotous immunization of the 16th century Muslim world reaching its apogee with Akbar looks quite different in some ways to the resurgent transcendentalism of the Reformation, which tears Europe apart by its refusal to accept aspects of the compromise with immunization. But in the later Islamic pushback we've just touched on, it may be possible to see some parallels, and I'll, I'll leave that to you. And as confessionalization theory would have it, perhaps there is some connection between transcendentalism and the desire of the burgeoning state to seize control of the religious sphere. And I look forward to the comments uh, of Ines Askerek Todd and, of course, Tiana Kerstich here on uh, confessionalization to see what they think. Of course, Sufism itself does not need to suffer here. It also has a deeply transcendentalist element which can allow uh, some Sufis, some Sufi orders to become uh, agents themselves of, of this tendency and, and, and leading a charge against monist uh, millenarian tendencies. Later, perhaps, of the Islamic reformism of the 18th and 19th centuries and a world in which we're still living with the attack on Sufism, we see the real backlash against forms of imminent, imminentization uh, more broadly. And that's a, 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 obviously a different um, wave of reform. So everything that I've said um, only works on the level of extreme generality. But if we want to describe a world in which the mystics stood at the center of the political order, we also need to understand how they got elbowed aside by scholar jurists and princes with quite other ideas. Thank you very much. Thank you.